Uh, good, good morning uh, and welcome to the 23rd meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I make the, the, the same advice as I normally do on mobile phones, please, and other equipment? Our first piece of business this morning today is to decide whether to take item three in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members are agreed. The second item on the agenda is to take evidence by video conference from Professor Mark Drakeford, who is the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Local Government at the Welsh Government. Professor Drakeford is leading on the Welsh Government's approach to Brexit and is supported today by Hugh Rawlings, who is the Director of Constitutional Affairs. Now, I'm, co I'm conscious Professor Drakeford has an, another appointment at 10.30, so we need to be grateful if members can keep their questions short and to the point. And I very warmly welcome Professor Drakeford to the meeting. Uh, would you like to make a short state opening statement, Professor Drakeford? Well, Chair, thank you very much. I'll, I'll just briefly set uh, the context for what I imagine will be a major focus of discussion this morning, uh, the withdrawal bill. And simply to say that uh, I had a first opportunity to discuss the Great Repeal Bill, as it was then called, shortly after the UK government announced its intention to introduce such a bill, because it was discussed at a JMC European negotiation. Uh, and I said at that meeting that the Welsh government hoped that the bill would be one that we could support, that we understood the need for a smooth transfer of the accumulated body of legislation accrued during our membership of the European Union to the set of circumstances we would face when we were no longer members of the Union. That we understood the need for corrective action to make sure that that acquired body of legislation could work effectively in the post-EU context. And that we understood the need for UK wide agreements to make sure that trade and other uh, inter um, UK uh, sets of arrangements could work smoothly in the post EU context. And indeed, at that very first meeting, uh, I was keen to offer the help of uh, our officials and our lawyers to the UK government in shaping their legislation because uh, we certainly, and I'm, I'm sure you, you too, you know, we spend our lives. Uh, looking at the border lines uh, between what is devolved and what is uh, devolved. It's, uh, it's our meat and drink. And I'm quite sure that at Whitehall, there are whole departments where this is a pretty peripheral part of what they normally need to think about. And we thought we had some expertise and some capacity that we could have contributed to help make the bill, a bill that we could have supported. Um, and I think our disappointment has been that despite being very clear that we set off in that constructive way, that those offers of help and those offers of engagement with the UK government have uh, really not been uh, taken up at all. As a result, we have a withdrawal bill, but as currently constructed, we cannot support, because at its heart, it has a way of going about things that is inimical to devolution. It tries to solve the problems that we agree are there to be solved by saying that the way to solve them is for the UK government to impose on us a set of solutions rather than doing it in the way we uh, advocated, which was to get around the table together, the component parts of the United Kingdom, and to create these solutions collectively, collaboratively, and by agreement. Um, now, the Welsh government and the Scottish government have worked closely together over the summer to come up with a set of amendments that we think are a constructive, carefully crafted uh, set of proposals that provide a solution to the UK government so that they can get out of the whole of their own making. Uh, and we will dedicate our efforts over this autumn to advancing those amendments to try and win the argument with the UK Government, if we can't win it with the government itself, we will take our arguments to the Parliament, both in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, because we think there is a better way of addressing the issues that the withdrawal bill quite rightly seeks to address, and that we can be part of an agreed way forward across the United Kingdom that will work for us in Wales, but work for the UK as well. 
Thank you very much, Professor Drakeford. I've got a couple of very general questions, one around relationships and one around frameworks, and my, uh, my colleagues here will get into some of the detail. Firstly, um, during an evidence session that we had with Mike Russell, who's the Minister for UK Negotiations in Scotland's Place in Europe, on the 20th of September, he described the relationship between the Scottish Government and Welsh Government around matters around the EU withdrawal bill. And he explained that, uh, uh, I think uh, probably a, a, an appropriate phrase, where common cause had been found uh, between the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government on these issues. On these issues. How, how would you describe that relationship? How would you characterise it? I, I think that's a fair way uh, of describing it, uh, Chair. I think it's always important for me uh, to say that in some ways, the position of the Welsh Government and the position of the Scottish Government is not the same. Uh, people in Scotland voted to stay in the European Union, and the Scottish Government believes that the future of Scotland is better crafted outside the United Kingdom. Uh, people in Wales voted to leave the European Union, and the Welsh Government believes that Wales' best interests are preserved by continued membership of the United Kingdom. So we come at some of these things from different positions. But quite certainly in relation to the withdrawal bill and the way that the UK government currently crafts it, we have a common cause in wishing to defend the parameters of devolution, uh, themselves established in two referendums here uh, in Wales and in the referendum uh, in Scotland. And we've worked hard together to see whether we can come up with constructive and detailed ways in which we think these problems could be solved in a better way. And in that sense, we do have a common cause, and we work closely together over the summer to pool our resources and to try and uh, set up a pathway over this autumn where we can jointly advocate the position we've arrived at. Thank you. I know that Neil Bibby has a supplementary in this area. Neil? Yeah, uh, thanks, convener. Um, it's good to see cooperation between the, the Scottish and, and Welsh governments and, and obviously a joined up approach on, on the common cause in relation to the EU withdrawal bill. You touched on it there, just the, the differences there were between the approaches of the um, Welsh and Scottish governments in, in, in relation to respecting the relevant um, results in, in Wales and Scotland. Is there anything in relation to the, to the bill, the EU withdrawal bill, that the Welsh and Scottish governments have a difference of opinion on? Uh, no, I think we have focused on the major areas of agreement, and, and they are very significant, uh, as you will have seen in the joint amendments that we've been able to uh, lay in the way that our legislative consent memorandums uh, have been shaped to make sure that we align our arguments there in the joint statements that the two first ministers have put out over uh, the summer. Uh, there are some very fundamental issues at stake here. Um, and while there may be you know, nuances in which we would uh, speak slightly differently, I, I think we made a very conscious decision that the issues that are at stake here are very important to the National Assembly and to the Welsh Government, to the Scottish Parliament as well as to the Scottish Government, and that we are much better off putting our energies into the things that we agree uh, on and trying, therefore, to maximise our ability to exert influence. Uh, thank you. Um, can I focus now, or, or turn the focus to the issue of frameworks? Uh, because I'm aware that, obviously, the Welsh Government, together with Plaid Cymru, said some interesting things around the frameworks, and particularly around issues to do with co-decision making. Uh, and I just wondered if you could help us understand it a bit more by explaining the Welsh Government's approach and, um, and application to that particular matter of frameworks. And I know there are some of my colleagues have got more detailed questions on it. So. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Chair. So look, uh, the link between frameworks and how decisions uh, are made is a very basic one for us, because we accept that there is a strong case for common frameworks to make the, the UK itself function effectively once we are no longer in the European Union. As I said earlier, we've always said we would come to the table to discuss those frameworks in a constructive way and looking for uh, agreement, and we think agreement is very uh, achievable. 
how though um, do we um, create a future for the United Kingdom after the European Union when the borderline between devolved and non-devolved will not be as simple as it may have been uh, in the past? How do we make sure we can get round the table together in a way that allows the component parts of the United Kingdom to share information and come to agreements where uh, necessary? And because our emphasis is on agreement, we published uh, a paper, Brexit and Devolution, that tries to look ahead to the United Kingdom after the European Union. And we make a series of proposals uh, there to develop the JMC into a form of Council of Ministers, uh, where we would be able to come together as equals uh, and to come to important agreements together. That's important to us because, as I say, from a Welsh government's point of view, uh, we believe in the continuation of the United Kingdom and we want the United Kingdom to be able to function effectively. But our document is intended to be part of a debate rather than a definitive set of proposals. Um, we are frustrated in a way that we are not able, apparently, to have the sort of discussion we think is needed about the future of the United Kingdom after the, the European Union. There is very little appetite uh, in Whitehall to engage in such uh, a set of discussions. And we felt it was important to publish a set of ideas in order to try and stimulate that debate and to see what, how people reacted to our, our ideas and how we might shape them further together. Thank you. I think Adam Tompkins would like to ask a question. <coughs> Thank you, convener, and, and good morning. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I want to ask you a bit more, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, about the, the, the detail of your understanding of the common frameworks that you've just been talking about with the, with the convener and others. Um, uh, the, the Scottish Government a few weeks ago published a list of 111 powers that uh, is a list that was drawn up by the Cabinet Office. Um, there's a list of um, uh, powers that fall within devolved competence that are currently exercised at EU level. Now, I don't think anybody is suggesting that we need 111 common frameworks, uh, but everybody seems to be suggesting, and you said in your opening remarks, Cabinet Secretary, that um, you understand the need for UK-wide agreements. So everybody seems to be uh, agreed that there needs to be some common frameworks. Nobody's ever yet identified where we need common frameworks. Uh, has the Welsh Government begun to think about you know, the kinds of areas where we will need substantive common frameworks? And if so, can you identify or help us to identify what those areas might be? Well, thank you uh, for that question. Um, we, we also have a list provided by the Cabinet Office. It has 64 areas in the Welsh context for reflecting the different uh, range of devolution responsibilities. And yes, no, our starting point will be the one that you've uh, articulated. You know, we don't believe that all 64 areas require frameworks. Um, so we are trying to have some discussions at official level with the Cabinet Office about how, in the spectrum of that list, uh, which are the ones which we think do require frameworks. And where we do require frameworks, there may be a differentiated approach to the sort of frameworks that we need. Mm. Uh, some things may require no more than a memorandum of understanding between the component parts as to how something might be done. Uh, there may be other things at a different end of the spectrum which need something more significant and substantial to underpin uh, a framework. We're trying to tease out with the Cabinet Office, you know, where they see that, uh, how they see that frame, uh, that spectrum uh, panning out. Um, to give you, you know, the most obvious example, the one that is most, most obviously cited about where we would want to have a common framework, we have four different animal health regimes mm. uh, across the United Kingdom. Um, this is very um, uh, alive in the minds of the National Assembly because one of the formative experiences of devolution in Wales uh, within the first couple of years of devolution was the outbreak of foot and mouth uh, disease uh, that we faced here. And the, the need to coordinate animal health regimes has been you know, apparent to us uh, ever since. Now, we, you know, we completely agree. We would not want four different animal health uh, regimes. So let's find a framework that allows us to make sure we can conduct that business in an orderly, agreed way. That's, that's extremely helpful. Thank you. Can I, can I just um, uh, try and understand a little bit more what you mean by 
um, having a, a, in different, different, a, a, you know, kind of a, a scale of different sorts of um, common frameworks, some of which could require nothing more than a memorandum of understanding, and some of which I think you just said might require something more significant. And, and can I ask you about what you mean by that? And in particular, do you mean this, that at the moment, um, uh, uh, it might be that there are um, no limits on the devolved competence of uh, your assembly or our parliament to enact legislation um, in some of these areas that feature on this list of 64 or 111 powers. Um, but might it be the case that there will have to be some limits on either legislative competence or executive competence in the two devolved nations um, in Scotland and Wales um, uh, that don't currently exist in order to give legal effect to these common frameworks? Is that, is that a position that the Welsh ministers are prepared to contemplate? Um, I think we're prepared to contemplate it in this way. But I can imagine situations in which there would need to be some limits on the exercise of devolved competencies in the future where we have come to an agreement about a common framework. So how would those limits be achieved? Well, our uh, position would be this that those limits would be achieved through the self-denying ordinance of Welsh ministers, yeah. having come to an agreement that required us to uh, agree to some limitations, then we would do that by agreement. We would commit ourselves to doing that because we would have come to uh, an agreement. What we would not be willing to contemplate would be a situation in which, having come to an agreement where some limitation on the use of current powers was uh, part of that agreement, but the answer of the UK government would be to say, well, in that case, we'll take that power away from you because you've agreed now that you're not going to need it because you've, you've come to an agreement with us. Uh, that wouldn't be our way of doing it. We would say if you come to an agreement and the agreement involves some limitation on the use of powers we have, we're committed to that agreement. Uh, and we would not use the powers that we have in a way that would violate that agreement. Why would we? We would just have come to an agreement. That's the mature way we believe of conducting relationships across the United Kingdom. And, and, and how, how would that agreement be enforced in the um, uh, surely wholly unlikely event, but nonetheless we have to think about unlikely events, that it is somehow inadvertently breached by one party or the other? If it, if it, if it, well, we if, no, sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, indeed. Look, we do set out in our, uh, our paper ways in which we think those things uh, would be resolvable if... Uh, uh, if you come to an agreement, but when in the implementation of the agreement you come to uh, areas where people have different views about implementation or indeed inadvertent ways in which things have been um, have not been observed. We, we set out a way, a mechanism for being alert to those situations, for resolving them. We have dispute resolution mechanisms uh, already within the devolution uh, settlement. We think they need to be revisited and uh, updated and, and so on, but we already have uh, mechanisms we can work from. They're agreed mechanisms. Uh, and we have a joint responsibility for policing and enforcing uh, them. It cannot be uh, a, uh, the answer to say the three of the four partners surrender uh, the ability to police and enforce to, to one partner uh, around that table. Indeed. But you do accept in principle that there might be, need, there might be a need for additional limits on legislative and executive competence in Scotland and in Wales in order to give legal effect to the common frameworks that need to be negotiated? Provided that is done in the way that I described, for a self-denying ordinance, that you agree that limitations may be necessary, you agree what those limitations would be, and then you voluntarily abide by them, and then you have a backup set of mechanisms to make sure that the voluntary agreements you've entered into are effectively delivered. Thank you very much. Of course, before we get to agreeing any common frameworks, um, there are significant issues to be overcome in the EU withdrawal bill. And I know that um, Marie Todd would like to ask you some questions about that particular issue and Clause 11 in particular. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, thank you for your time this morning. Um, Clause 11 is a new limitation on the power of the Scottish Parliament. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about why it's causing concern and what progress has been made to resolving that? Well, uh, Clause uh, 11 is one of the 
fundamental reasons why we would not be able to recommend the National Assembly of Wales to give its consent uh, to, to the UK government to legislate in this area because uh, it is the, the most significant place where the debate that we have just um, outlined um, plays out. So our position uh, is this. There are a set of devolved responsibilities that have been in the National Assembly for Wales since 1999. They're not powers that have come to us recently or later on in devolution. They were here from the very beginning in agriculture and environment and fisheries and so on. Um, and since then, we have chosen to uh, exercise those responsibilities through our membership of the European Union. When the European Union is no longer part of our landscape, those powers haven't gone anywhere. They will rest where they have always been. They've been in the devolved uh, legislatures since the very beginning, unless the UK government decides to take them away from us. And that's what Clause 11 does. It rolls back devolution. It takes responsibilities that we have had since the very start of devolution and says that in future, for an indefinite uh, period of time, and to an extent that they cannot explain to us, that those powers will be taken back to Westminster and that in some future date, they will be eked back out uh, to us. In the meantime, UK ministers will have had all sorts of powers to interfere with those responsibilities. So we don't know when we will get powers back, and we don't know what those powers will look like by the time they come our way again. And we say that that is just fundamentally unacceptable from a devolved uh, perspective. Thank you for that clarification. I, I, I wonder if you could tell me a little more about what you think would um, fix Clause 11. So um, does it have to be removed entirely? Are there ways that could be amended to make it palatable? It is such a fundamental attack on the devolved parliaments. Well, we believe that the amendments that we have jointly uh, sponsored with the Scottish government provide a different and much preferable way of resolving the issue that Clause 11 attempts to uh, resolve. I mean, it rests in the way that I've tried to rehearse on an approach that says that the way to make sure that there is an orderly conduct of business across the United Kingdom after the European Union is to do so by agreement, to bring the component parts of the United Kingdom together to agree on ways in which we would conduct uh, these important areas uh, in the future, and then having come to an agreement you know, to move forward in a mature way to implement that agreement. Those are the, that's the way forward that our amendments uh, envisage, and it's why we've been so keen to not just complain about Clause 11 or the other clauses in the bill, but actually to put forward you know, a very well worked out and we believe constructively intended set of solutions through our amendments that would allow the UK government to achieve the shared aims that we have with them about making sure that after the European Union, uh, things work in a sensible uh, way that doesn't get in the way of people wanting to conduct business and, and so on, um, but can do that in a way that respects the devolution uh, settlement respects the way in which, 20 years on from devolution, the United Kingdom is a very different place than it was in 1999, and a fundamentally different place than it was in 1972. Um, can I ask w one final question? Can, can, I mean, can you envisage a way forward in which the Welsh Parliament could consent to the EU withdrawal bill if there is still a Clause 11 in there? Oh, uh, Chair, I think if Clause 11 um, was unamended, um, then it's very difficult indeed for me to imagine uh, a situation in which our First Minister would be able to recommend to the National Assembly that it gives its legislative consent, because it would be to invite the National Assembly of Wales to connive in its, in, in its own diminution. And I don't see it doing that. Thank you. Okay, um, Murdo Fraser has a supplementary in this area. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just as a follow-up to, to uh, Marie Todd's questions, just so I'm, I'm clear in my own mind as to what the 
uh, Welsh Government's position is. Is, is, it, is it your contention that there are powers currently being exercised by the Welsh Assembly that would be taken away if the bill were to pass into law unamended? I'll, I'll just ask Hugh to make sure you get the definitive legal answer on that point, <laughs> sir. Um, Chair, I, I think the position is, well, obviously, as, as the Cabinet Secretary has laid out, um, the, uh, the powers, as the Welsh Government sees them, lie with the, um, uh, the Welsh Government and the National Assembly. They are subject to the constraint that the powers must be exercised compatibly with European uh, Union law at present. When uh, we leave the European Union, what the bill envisages is that a new substantial body of law uh, deriving from the UK's membership of the European Union um, becomes unamendable by either the Welsh ministers or the uh, National Assembly. And that, that uh, even though that body of law may in, um, involve devolved matters. And in those circumstances, uh, you have a substantial block of law, if you like, that is uh, not subject to modification by the devolved uh, institutions. And that is, represents a fundamental problem, I think. Right. So just, 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 just so I understand this clearly, there, there is currently, in your view, a constraint on the operation of the Welsh Assembly legislating, which is EU law, that constraint would be replaced in terms of this bill with a, const with, with a constraint exercised by Westminster instead of the EU. But, but you're not saying that where the Welsh Assembly currently has the power to legislate uh, without constraint, that that will be somehow be restricted or removed by this bill? Uh, I, I'm, there are some rather difficult technical arguments here um, uh, um, around, for example, uh, Clause 2 of the Bill. Um, this could be a slightly lengthy exposition, um, which the committee probably doesn't want to hear. Um, but um, it, it is true that, uh, so far as one can see, that broadly speaking, and it has to be qualified in that way, existing powers of amendment um, uh, or, or, or uh, existing powers of devolved institutions uh, would not be constrained or limited. What would be uh, the result of the, um, uh, the withdrawal bill is that there would be instituted into the body of domestic law a body of law which the retained EU law, which even though it is within the area of devolved competence, would not be subject to the modification by the devolved institutions. And that represents some real difficulties for us. And Chair, the other real difficulty, that, you know, I, I've heard this argument put by UK ministers, but somehow the bill just leaves uh, the devolved administrations where they've always been. So what, what's your problem? Uh, the problem is, is that while it may, in subject to the caveats that Hughes outlined, leave us where we are, it allows UK ministers an unfettered right to roam, in which they are given powers uh, to amend all sorts of things. And not simply to uh, amend things that we are not able to amend in non-devolved fields, but it gives them the right to reach over into devolved responsibilities to make changes in areas which are currently only changeable by the Scottish Parliament, and to do so without the consent either of Scottish ministers or the Scottish Parliament or Welsh ministers or the National Assembly uh, for Wales. So to leave one part of a system unchanged while fundamentally changing the powers available to another part of the system and not to take that second thing into account uh, seems to me to be, um, well, naive might be a kind way of describing it. Okay. Thank you, that's very helpful. I mean, it might, it might help us if you could give us an example of what you're talking about. Well, if, for example, uh, there were um, legislation that 
that had a primary legislation that had been adopted by the UK Parliament um, on, let's say, environmental protection. And that legislation, uh, the reason for bringing it forward was that it was to implement uh, um, a European directive. Now, as you know, the normal way of implementing European directives, or a very common way, is by way of statutory instrument. Um, and what the bill does, and perfectly understandably, it maintains or, or retains in domestic law um, the uh, statutory instruments that have been made under the 1972 European Communities Act, even though the European Communities Act is going to be repealed. But there are other ways of implementing European uh, legislation, or European directives, and one of them is primary legislation. And so let's assume that you've got an act of parliament which has implemented some European directive in the field of um, environmental protection. Now, that legislation before this bill would in turn have been amendable by the, European, uh, by the Welsh uh, Assembly because it is within a matter within devolved competence. But the way the European uh, Withdrawal Bill is drafted means that that legislation, because it was originally uh, a mechanism for implementing uh, a European directive, ceases to be, uh, be part of the competence of, the, of, of the, the Welsh Assembly to modify. We may just need to make some minor technical amendments if we were to bring forward a new environmental protection bill perhaps to modify, uh, to make some minor amendments to an earlier Europe, um, UK Parliament <coughs> Act. If that UK Parliament Act was originally enacted to give effect to a European Union directive, then we can't do so. That is not something, that w not a position that we've been in before. Okay. Right, thank you. Patrick Harvey. Thanks, convener. Good morning. I'd like to explore uh, a little more your suggestions about how the intergovernmental relationship ought to work in the future. Uh, the phrase that you've used uh, is a, uh, the intergovernmental machinery must be reformed with a new UK Council of Ministers. Now that's a, a term that many countries use, but it's most familiar to us uh, in the context of the European Union's Council of Ministers. Uh, are you suggesting a mechanism which, like that body, uses qualified majority voting, which has a, a rotating presidency, uh, which has a, a degree of co-decision making with the legislature in its own right as a body? Well, a number of those things uh, are uh, rehearsed in our paper. Uh, we, we do. Uh, put forward arguments about qualified majority voting as a way of coming to uh, decisions across the United Kingdom. I've uh, had an opportunity to discuss this with Mike uh, Russell. I, I know that, you know, I think his view is that there are some instances where that would be a sensible uh, way of proceeding, but that it may not be a generally applicable rule. But as I said in my opening remarks, you know, uh, our effort was to try and stimulate exactly that sort of debate and to try and see um, what others would think of the proposals that we have uh, set out there. Um, in terms of a rotating presidency, um, I, I, I do think it is unsatisfactory myself, you know, that in the position that we are in, that when it comes to the Joint Ministerial uh, Committee, the JMC, apparently only one of the four uh, partners in it is able to call a James. Um, and that, that doesn't seem to me to be a sustainable way of conducting uh, inter-UK relations uh, in the future. So we look to try and uh, amend some of uh, those ways of doing things and just to try to say that co-decision uh, making, um, it's, a, it's a difficult concept sometimes for our UK colleagues uh, to grasp, particularly those who continue to uh, have a sort of grace and favour approach to devolution and a clear sense of hierarchy in which one of the partners is in charge. Uh, but we, we say that's not the, that isn't the UK of the future. 
Uh, it can't be. Um, it reflects uh, days long gone, really. We need a different approach uh, to it based on mutual respect, based on coming together. And then we think that will be a stronger uh, set of outcomes. I can understand the argument that you're making, and it's uh, many aspects of it are familiar uh, from some of the, the complaints that Mike Russell has made about the operation of the JMC. Uh, this is a, a situation that we've, we've had outlined to us before, and I hope that we have the opportunity to put some of those questions to UK ministers at some point as well. But I'm, I'm still a little unclear about the nature of the mechanism that you suggest would be better than this as a, as a replacement, and in particular, how the decisions of this Council of Ministers would be held accountable. Your decisions individually are accountable to your National Assembly. Mr Russell's decisions are accountable to this Parliament. Uh, UK ministers, for better or worse, are accountable to the Westminster Parliament with all of its uh, glories and all of its faults. How are the decisions of this Council of Ministers to be held accountable, uh, or would a, 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 an agreement signed up to by ministers in this, in this body uh, then simply be something that parliaments and assemblies uh, throughout these islands simply have to live with? Well, Chet, I uh, assume that, um, that these things will in many ways, you know, there will be a process involved uh, here, and quite certainly uh, here in the National Assembly for Wales, if I was involved on behalf of the, the Welsh Government in um, a Council of Ministers where matters were being uh, discussed, then well in advance of where you get to the point where something is agreed, uh, I would have been questioned uh, in the National Assembly, I would have been expected to appear in front of a committee of the National Assembly to be scrutinised on the uh, point of view that the Welsh Government was trying to advocate in those uh, discussions and when a, an agreement was reached. I will be held accountable here for the part that I had played in it and the agreement that we had come to. So um, this is not different in many ways from co-decision making arrangements in many parts uh, of our uh, democracy. Many years ago, I used to uh, represent uh, a Cardiff Council on the South Wales Police Authority with four other local authorities. We had to come to agreements there. And when I came back to the council in Cardiff, I would be questioned on how I had uh, stood up for the interests of Cardiff citizens in coming to those uh, agreements. It's a very common mm. way in which we manage to share, pool our sovereignty in the way that I know Microsoft yes, uh, put it. Uh, I, I, would imagine, I would imagine, though, that none of those other councils took the view that they represented all of the council areas. That's the distinction here. We're, whether there's a case for federalism in the UK or not, we're not in a federal arrangement. And the, the UK government, uh, if it has an arrangement that's been reached uh, through this, this new intergovernmental machinery, uh, may look very unkindly uh, on a decision uh, subsequent to that agreement uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, either the Scottish Government or the Welsh Government might decide we've changed our view about how a common framework ought to operate. We've changed our view about how a memorandum of understanding ought to be framed. Uh, my, my concern here is that we, we don't just leap to, the, to the, the, the most obvious next bit of stable ground because the world is so unstable around us. We have to have something that is capable of withstanding political change and changes of government. And if there's a self-denying ordinance, uh, as you put it to Adam Tompkins, in terms of the exercise uh, of powers that are constrained by UK-wide frameworks in Scotland and in Wales, what does that say about the ability of the Scottish or Welsh electorate to cast their vote differently, to change their government if they wish, and to elect a government that wants to operate those devolved competencies in a different way than is, uh, than is encapsulated in, in a... In a a, a common framework previously agreed. Jack, can I say that I think that these are all really important points and absolutely properly to be uh, debated and thought through in the way that we think about the future of the United Kingdom. I don't think our proposals amount to uh, a federal uh, solution. We, we don't have a federal system, but neither is the United Kingdom a unitary state mm. in the way that it was in 1972. So we do have to think creatively about the way in which we allow the United Kingdom to operate effectively 
uh, after the, the European Union. And to uh, go to your specific point of view, and I have no difficulty myself uh, in imagining how a political party here in the National Assembly, which is not in the government, could go to the electorate uh, at an assembly election and say, uh, your government entered into an agreement that looked like this. We don't think that was the right thing uh, to do. If you elect us, we will pursue a different course of action. But the way they would have to pursue it would have to be to go back to the other component parts of the United Kingdom in order to secure a new agreement. That's how it would have to be done. And they would have to explain to people in Wales that that's what they were proposing to them, that they would seek to persuade other parts of the United Kingdom to amend the agreement that they think doesn't stand so, up to. So even on those devolved matters, their hands would be tied? Okay. To move, move on to others, because we're just, I'm conscious of time here. Um, Patrick dealt with issues to do with the future Cabinet Secretary. I know that Ash Denham would like to look at the current structure and how, it, and, and how it's working or not. Ash. Good morning. Yes, I wanted to speak about IGR and um, the machinery as well, which has obviously been partially covered by my colleague here. Um, the Welsh Government has obviously set out um, how they found the JMCEN process to be particularly frustrating. You know, we've just spoken about your proposal to possibly move to um, a Council of Ministers way of operating. Um, I don't want to put words into the UK government's mouth, but assuming that there isn't uh, the political will on the part of the UK government to move to, to something like that and that that doesn't happen, do you think there's potential for the JMCEN process to be reset um, to make it fit for purpose in order to, to move forward? Well, uh, I certainly do think, Chair, that there are a series of practical proposals. Uh, they're the proposals that Mike Russell and I set out in a joint letter almost immediately after the last UK general election, and which were very largely echoed and, in fact, um, in some ways elaborated in the House of Lords uh, report uh, on all of this. And I think we, we worked very hard in our letter to try and take any sort of partisan uh, quality out of those proposals to pitch them very much at the practical end of the spectrum and to try to say to the UK government, while the JMCEN is the vehicle we have, we've all got an interest in making that experience a more satisfactory experience than it has been so far. And here are some ways in which we think that could be done. Uh, and as I say, we've, we've, we've very much pitched them at the practical end of the spectrum um, we hope that when the JMC reconvenes, uh, that some of those ideas will have been uh, taken up. Because I can't imagine that the JMC EN has been a satisfactory experience for any of the people who have been on that table, including UK government. So I believe I'm right in remembering that one of the practical suggestions was that agendas be you know, circulated in advance. Have you received an agenda for the next meeting as yet? Do you know what you're expecting to discuss at that meeting? Well, I, I have seen an agenda. It's being discussed at uh, official uh, level, and I think we're quite close to agreeing what that agenda uh, should be. So that's an advance. That's a piece of good news. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, as, I'm sure, as I'm sure Mr. Russell will have told you, uh, the, the last meeting at JMC EN back in February, um, we, uh, we left Cardiff not simply not having had papers or, or minutes of previous meetings and things, but we didn't even know where the meeting was going to take place. We got on the train here, there wasn't even a room agreed for it. So, you know, part of our practical suggestions are simply to get those mechanics in better order. The JMCEN was meant to be a very serious forum. The Prime Minister set a very ambitious uh, remit uh, for it. And if you've, got a, uh, if you've got a forum which is meant to be doing serious business, then it, it, it deserved a different level of basic support. Okay, one very brief final question. I think the expectation, perhaps, from the devolved um, governments was that this process would involve, you know, extensive sort of collaborative working and so on. And I think that you, the devolved nations obviously feel that the JMCEN has really failed in what it set out to do. But do you get the feeling that the UK government also feels that? Or actually, do they feel that, you know, it's from their perspective that it's kind of working as well as they thought it would? I can't imagine they, they think it has worked as well as 
anybody would have hoped. It certainly didn't live up to the ambition that the Prime Minister uh, set for it in arriving at a shared negotiating prospectus as far as the Article 50 uh, triggering uh, letter was concerned. Um, Chair, if I'm being frank, I, I, I think there were a number of things that have gone in the way of the JMC. Some of them are the practical things we uh, talked about. But more fundamentally, my own experience, my own view has been that the JMC has been hamstrung by the fact that the UK government itself is often not in an agreed position on a number of the very significant things that the JMC was there to discuss. And because there were so many fissures uh, inside the UK government on these matters, the nature of the discussion that we were able to have was so superficial, you know, could never get into any detail because it would immediately expose differences of view between within the UK government. But discussion was kept at a level that was frustratingly general for everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, convener, and thank you for uh, coming along to talk to us this morning. Um, Clearly, you're, you're in a position in the Welsh Government at the moment where you're not able to, to recommend consent for the EU withdrawal bill as written, and a number of amendments have been proposed in conjunction with the, the Scottish Government. I think my question, my question has got two parts. First of all, of those amendments, um, I, I don't want to use the word red line, but which of them do you see as being the most, the most critical to, um, to gaining an agreement through a negotiation between yourselves? and uh, the UK government. And secondly, if there's a failure to agree on amendments to the, to the EU with, uh, withdrawal bill, where does that then take you? Because I see in your, um, in your letter, you've um, begun to consider the scope for alternative devolved legislation, um, in other words, for a, a continuity bill of some type. Um, so that maybe you can explain a bit more around those, those issues. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. So but our amendments come as a package deal because they address uh, the, di the different aspects of this bill are interrelated with one another and our amendments are interrelated uh, with one another and at the moment we don't uh, have a sense of hierarchy between them in which you know one is more important than the other they come as a they come as a package and we will pursue them as uh, a package now I think that there is um, there is a sort of you know pathway of um, negotiations uh, here. Our first aim will be to persuade the UK government of the sensible nature of our case, of the constructive nature of our case, of how what we are trying to do is in many ways to find a better way to achieve the outcomes which they themselves are signed up to and with, where we see the sense of those outcomes. So there are a series of opportunities uh, where we meet with UK ministers uh, separately and now through the JMC collectively, where we will make that case. And I've not given up uh, by any means uh, on the idea that a UK government that is badly in need of friends uh, and it has, in a way that I find completely baffling, um, turned an area where they had friends at the beginning into uh, having to be opponents of them, but they may come to the realization themselves that our amendments are things that they could work on with us and come to an agreement with them. So that's our first point of call, and we've not exhausted uh, that course of action uh, by any means. If we were not to succeed in persuading the UK government, then we move to the UK Parliament, uh, and we will uh, hope that we will see our amendments supported in the House of Commons, and we will do everything we can to mobilise friends in the House of Commons who believe in devolution and who know that this bill is inimical to devolution, members of the Scottish National Party, and the Labour Party, the Green MP, uh, Liberal Democrats, like Cymru members. We will do our best to create as broad a coalition as we can in the House of Commons. And if we don't succeed in the House of Commons, then we will mount a major effort in the House of Lords to persuade uh, members of the House of Lords to support our amendments. So that's our second uh, point of call. And I, I'm just going to say, uh, Chair, again this morning, what I say whenever I have a chance, that the UK government need to understand that we are deadly serious about this. Uh, this is not sabre-rattling. This is not just us trying to have some sort of you know, rhetorical five minutes in the sun. Here. 
Uh, we are going to go about this in a very serious way. We will mobilize whatever we can and work with whoever we are able to in order to defeat their, uh, their proposals. Uh, now, it's only when we've exhausted that course of action as well that we will then think about whether, having not managed to um, win those arguments in the way I've described, whether a continuity bill uh, would be necessary. And because we have to think uh, ahead in that way, we are doing work in the background to put ourselves in a position should we need it, but it's not our first port of call, so I'm trying to say it's much further down the line and there are other and better ways of achieving what we want to achieve. But if we had to, or we needed to, we want to put ourselves in a position where that course of action would be available to us. Were we to think it a, the right thing to do at that time? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Uh, Professor Drakeford, could you, could you just tell us what the political party's views in the Welsh Assembly are on the Welsh Government's position in relation to Clause 11 and the removal of powers from Wales? Do you have a consensus approach there or is there still some disagreement? Well, my, my assessment of where parties in, in the Welsh Assembly are on this chair. Um, the government is made up of Labour and uh, the one Liberal Democrat uh, member of the National Assembly. So those two parties are quite certainly lined up uh, with our proposals. We have worked closely with uh, Plaid Cymru um, in the Brexit context. We have a joint committee uh, that we have uh, with them and we published our very first uh, white paper on Wales's position uh, on Europe jointly with by Cymru, and I'm quite uh, confident that we would have the support of all my Cymru members in the National Assembly for the amendments that we have uh, outlined. Um, we have UKIP members uh, in the National Assembly um, whose position is a good deal more difficult to predict. Um, but even UKIP members in the in the Assembly have made speeches uh, um, setting out their um, belief in uh, the integrity of the devolution uh, settlement. So it will be interesting to see how far uh, they take that course of action. And as far as the Welsh Conservatives are concerned, um, the First Minister here made a, uh, a statement on Brexit matters on the floor of the Assembly uh, within the last uh, 10 days. And the uh, Conservative spokesperson on this matter uh, made an offer during that discussion uh, to have a meeting with the government to explore our amendments and to see whether there was any common ground uh, that they could align themselves with uh, too. And that meeting has now been uh, arranged, will happen later uh, this week. And um, I, I can't anticipate the outcome uh, of it, but it was, um, it, it was a significant offer that I think that was made. Okay, thank you. Neil, no, no, Bibby. Um, thanks, convener. Um, we discussed in detail um, this morning the need to improve inter-UK uh, relations, and <clears throat> you described earlier that there was little appetite in Whitehall um, for doing that. You've rightly, I think, suggested that we should have um, a convention on the future of the United Kingdom in the longer term to look at uh, ways of uh, improving the governance of, of the UK. I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about how you see that working, I know so you're talking about trying to achieve cross-party support and uh, civil society consensus for changes across the UK. Yes, thank you, Chair. Our First uh, Minister, Caroline Jones, has um, been a very long advocate uh, of this approach going back, probably even to before the current... 2012. Uh, 2012, there we are. So well back into the last uh, parliamentary uh, term. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think he comes at it, uh, as I say, from the point of view of a government that thinks that Wales' future is best preserved by a united uh, kingdom that is able to work uh, together. But a frustration uh, that um, the mechanics of doing so have failed to keep up with the development of evolution, believing that if you are to uh, create new and better ways of intergovernmental cooperation within the United Kingdom, that that means people coming together, sitting down, sharing ideas, trying to create a way forward that we can have the maximum uh, support for. But it, 
it requires a very rich conversation, it requires a very um, a, a very real willingness to think creatively about the ways in which we can make sure the United Kingdom has a successful uh, future and a frustration really uh, that it has been difficult to get that conversation going uh, to the extent that we think uh, the urgent need for it uh, has been there and the urgency of the need has very much been increased by the fact that a series of mechanisms we've been able to rely on through the European Union will not be available to us uh, in the future. I, I, t I take it then you would encourage all, all governments and all parts of the UK and all parties then to back, back the idea of coming together in a, a convention? Well, different ways in which that could be done, Chair, you know, a speaker's convention, um, uh, uh, an intergovernmental uh, convention, but we believe that the need to have those conversations are very uh, real and that European uh, exiting the European Union makes them even more necessary. I've got one final question from Adam Tompkins. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, in your um, Brexit and devolution paper published in June, um, the Welsh Government said that um, withdrawing from the European Union in a, matter, in a matter that respects and accommodates devolution is, and I quote, straightforwardly achievable. That's what you said in June, and I agree with you. Do you still hold to that view? Um, our amendments to the bill set up that straightforward way of doing so. All right, thank you very much. Okay, I, I can I thank Professor Drakeford and Hugh Rawlings for taking time to give us evidence today. Um, at the start of the meeting, we agreed to take the ne next item in, uh, in, in private, but can I just say that that was a very useful, informative and very constructive session, and I'm very grateful for the time you've given us, and, uh, and I'll close this part of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for the questions as well.